started. Um, thank you for those of us who are joining us for the annual conference event that's happening um, here online on our Mobile Cause platform from October 1st through the 9th. Today is Thursday, October 8th, um, or at least it is by the time you're seeing this. We're really happy to have you here and we hope that you've been enjoying the content that we've had so far. Today, I am here with MGMI founder, Esther Land, who's been living with MG for several decades, and she'll tell us a little bit more about that in a minute. And we've also got another patient, Alice Gray. She's a very talented artist, yeah, <laughs> who we're very blessed to have here in West Michigan. Um, and she'll tell us a little bit more about herself, too, and her experience. She's also been living with MG in some other conditions for varying amounts of time, but um, between the two of them, we have a ton of personal patient experience that we are going to be sharing with you today. So I guess let's get started. Um, Esther, would you tell us first a little bit, just a quick synopsis of how long have you been living with MG and have you experienced crisis during that time? Thank you, Alicia. Yeah, um, I have had MG for 60 years in, in the December of this year, it will be 60 years. Um, I had generalized myasthenia, um, ocular, arms, legs, you know, swathing, breathing, swallowing. Um, I have had two crises. Um, they were quite a while ago. The first one is in 1973, uh, and it developed after I had a really bad cold. And then the second one was in 1975, and that was a true myasthenic crisis um, that landed me in the hospital for a number of weeks. So, yep. Okay. Well, we'll maybe delve into a little bit more about that as we go on too. But Alice, um, can you share with us some of your experience living with MG and, and if you've been through some crises yourself? Okay. Um, I was diagnosed my last, or I was diagnosed at 19, but my symptoms started my last year of high school. And then my first crisis was during my thymectomy. Um, and I've had six crises so far. Uh, my last one was a year and a half ago. So I guess this would be a good place to say, to maybe explain to those watching, like, what is an MG crisis? Because I know that um, depending on the source that you go to, to hear that, you might learn something different in a patient Facebook page or group than your doctor might think is a crisis. Alice, could you maybe explain a little bit about um, what is an MG crisis to your physician and then maybe also what, uh, what do people sometimes think is a crisis that maybe isn't exactly what your doctor would think? Okay. The term MG crisis refers to a very specific phenomenon where someone can't breathe because of the myasthenia gravis muscle weakness. It's where the diaphragm becomes so weak that you need invasive uh, respiratory support, um, usually on a ventilator, but sometimes uh, manually ventilated, usually intubated. So a full MG crisis is when you stop breathing or are in imminent danger of stopping breathing. Uh, sometimes patients use the term crisis when actually a uh, severe flare or um, would be a more accurate term. Okay, Esther, um, what would you like to weigh in on that? I just, I, Esther and I have shared notes just for those watching. So I know that Esther has a few notes specifically about this. So uh, what would you like to weigh in for that too? Okay, I, I would like to say a couple of things. First of all, not everyone gets a crisis. So don't think because you have myasthenia gravis, you're gonna get a crisis. Um, I've generally, heard 10 the, of people maybe about twenty percent nowadays may get a crisis, and it seems from what I have observed, if you have had one crisis, you may get another. Um, that's not always true, but that does happen. And again, your warning signs are when you feel your MG symptoms worsening. Um, that may mean that you are 
having more difficulty swallowing or chewing. Um, usually it's the ball bar, um, the, the cranial symptoms that affect you most because that's then it will go into the breathing where you um, probably have a, a weak speaking voice, um, become nasal, and those those are signs that you should consider seriously going to ER. So bulbar symptoms, um, the breathing, the swallowing, being right. able to hold your head up, things like that. Right. Okay. Right. Alice, were you going to weigh in on that too? Uh, yes, mine have always been triggered by anesthesia or infection. So for me, it's never been a surprise. Um, I've always already been in a medical setting when it's happened. Okay. Um, we had mentioned, or you, you ladies had both just mentioned too, and I guess I, I, that made me realize that we forgot to say, just an FYI, the three of us are not medical professionals. Um, we're definitely just speaking on, on the experience. Sharing our own experiences. Yes, own personal experiences. Please, um, anything that you learn on this is for informational purposes. And we're, of course, welcome to take some questions. You can always email those to us at info at mg-mi.org. And then you can join us also for another panel discussion with these ladies later on this year. Um, for any questions that you want to ask about that, but do not hesitate to ask your own physician, um, your own clinicians, if you've got any concerns about yourself or whether or not you are experiencing crisis. Um, but as Esther and Alice had both mentioned, uh, statistically, it's not very likely that you're going to. Um, many MG patients never experience a crisis. Um, the numbers kind of vary anywhere from 10 to 25 percent of patients might experience crisis. And then to the point that Esther had made too, sometimes if you've had one crisis, that might mean that um, you're maybe more likely to have another. Um, but again, this, you know, it's not a guarantee. You might just have that one crisis and never have one again. So um, it's certainly something that is serious, but not something that is imminent or that we need to fear happening to all of us eventually, is that that seems probably the right way to look at it. Um, are there any steps that can be taken to avoid it? Like, I know, Alice, you had mentioned, you know, yours, you've always been in a clinical setting for a different thing. So what are some ways that we can, like, lessen the risk of having crisis, do you think? Um, well, I guess anesthesia and infections and changes in medication uh, are some of the things that put us at risk of having crisis. So I always talk to my anesthesiologist, um, tell my doctors about that, um, especially with my past experiences. I say what happened last time. Uh, I had, uh, with anesthesia, general, spinal, and local self for me. Um, so one time it happened just in the doctor's office, which was a little bit of a surprise, and now he won't quit bragging about how well he handled it. Uh, so uh, talking to your doctors and be, having a plan in place, I think the Mycenae Gravis Foundation has uh, handy little information pamphlets yeah, on crisis. And then realizing, yeah, realizing medicines like anesthesia, antibiotics, or just the infection itself uh, can set things off. So paying attention to that list of um, risky meds or meds to use with caution is a really important first step to making sure that we're not predisposing ourselves to a crisis when we don't need to. Okay. And Esther. planning procedures to take that into account. Like uh, when I had my wisdom teeth removed, I had it removed in a hospital setting instead of an outpatient setting. Okay. And so some of that is also, um, you know, like learning from the experiences that you have had and being able to advocate for yourself with your clinicians going forward too. Because um, I guess we... That may be a whole other discussion with you, Alice, but um, you've definitely had to go to bat for yourself a few times and had to be the 
the naysayer in the room <laughs> um, just to make sure that you were getting the care that you knew you needed, even if sometimes the clinician treating you wasn't maybe hearing you as well as they could have been. Or my mother too has acted as my advocate. Okay. Yeah. So always, always having that advocate too. Um, if so you are, if you are, um, in, in a hospital, it's good to have an advocate with you because if, if speaking is a problem, communication can be detrimental. Yeah, if you can't get a breath in and can't speak very clearly or at all, right, then um, communicating in general can be a challenge. And I'm imagining, is, the, is it like, you know, crisis is breathing issues, but that probably the fatigue and the other like physical um, manifestations of crisis probably don't necessarily just stop at breathing, right? Like you might still have trouble writing because you have weakness because you're not getting that air in and things like that. Right. And double vision and okay, double holding head up and <laughs> okay. Now, um, Esther, you and I have talked about how there's um, there's myasthenic crisis that can be triggered from all these different things, but there's also cholinergic crisis. What what's the difference between those two things? Okay, when you are on mestinon, um, it it's an anticholinesterous medication. And if you get too much, you, your symptoms can be the same as too little. And so when you are admitted to the hospital, to ER, that is a factor that they should keep in mind. And they will ask you, when have you taken your last medication and how much something to that effect? Because um, in myasthenia, and on Mestinon, more is not necessarily better. <laughs> so keeping track of your meds, no, no self-medicating, keeping in communication with your clinicians if, you're, um, if you are wondering if you need more or less medicine, not just taking it upon yourself necessarily to make those big changes, but talking with your physician about it and um, learning the best ways to go about experimenting with that a little bit if that's what what you've decided needs to happen. Right. And, okay. and listen to have your a body. flexible dose plan for me. What was that, Alice? Oh, sorry. Uh, my doctors and I have a pretty flexible dose plan for me because my mestinol needs vary from day to day or week to week, uh, depending upon activity level and general health level. And was that something that you developed um, like over an amount of time with your doctors kind of based on your what you were experiencing with your MG and other conditions that you navigate? Yeah, something we developed over time, kind of learning what my um, triggers were. Uh, so things like hot weather, I usually need more things where I'm exercising more or if I have a bit of a cold, I need more. And then when we added in other immunosuppression meds, I was able to back off and take less. Is that the uh, similar experience to what you had experienced, Esther, as well, or what you've heard from um, Esther's, Esther's spoken to thousands of MG patients, probably. You know, people call because they want to know what she has to say about it based on what she has heard from, you know, all these other patients she's talked to. So what are some of the things that you've learned from your own? Again, I, I can't stress enough, listen to your body. When you take medication, particularly the mestinon or pyridostigmine bromide, um, does have a more limited um, lifespan than what your immunosuppressants do. Your, your immunosuppressant, like azathioprine, um, imiran, uh, salsep, mycophenolate, those are longer acting, but your mestinon um, lasts probably four to six hours. And it takes about 20 minutes to work into your system. So listen to your body. If this is how you will even help yourself to um, sort of self-dose. Initially, when a patient is diagnosed, they're given one tablet three times a day. 
So listen to your body. What happens when you take it? Um, how long before you start feeling the symptoms become pronounced? So, and this is where, as you are going into a crisis, if you are, are on a regular regimen and notice that your mestinon is not lasting as long or your symptoms are worse, these are things to watch for. And things you might be able to gather good data on over time. So keeping a journal or um, if there's, yeah. you know, an app on your phone that you can keep that sort of information on, something like that, that might be really helpful for patients. This goes back before these fancy phones, but I literally had a chart and it, and I, it was hourly. Um, well, probably every two hours and I would make snap judgments. I was good. I was mediocre, I was lousy. And this helped me to judge how I should um, fluctuate my medications. Alice, did you kind of go through a similar, like did you keep a, a journal with data points for yours as well or was it a little more? Um, I don't think I was quite that organized, uh, <laughs> but definitely the first year was kind of a learning curve. Yeah, I, I believe that. Now, um, we had talked a little bit about the fact that crisis is not, it's not just, um, it's not pneumonia, right? Pneumonia can, can cause crisis, but like what would be some other respiratory difficulties that MG patients might experience that aren't crisis so that they don't need to think that that's where they're headed? Or I guess to lead Again. into like, well, uh, it's primarily a crisis deals with breathing. So if your arms are weak, I mean, it, it is an um, increase of your myasthenic symptoms, but doesn't necessarily mean you require emergency treatment. Okay. Um, and it could be the other way around. Your arms might be okay, but your breathing is weak. Right. Okay, yeah. Now, um, I've read and, and heard people talk about using something called a single breath test. Um, could you, Alice, do you want to tell us what that's, what it, what is a single breath test and what, um, how is that used? I in if I could pass that one to Esther, I think she's probably more familiar with it oh, than I am. Oh, sure, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Basically, a single breath test is the volume of your voice and how audible it is as you inhale and as you exhale. So if you can count to 20 on a single breath and still have good volume, then you are probably not going into a crisis. But if you can only get to eight, 10, 12, and really feel your symptoms are, are you can't get the wording out, that's that's a sing, uh, one aspect of considering ER. And it's good to um, practice these things when you're feeling pretty good, so you have a baseline. Right. So when you start feeling sick, you can compare it to something. Okay. So on a good day, try this single breath test when you're feeling good and your movement's good and your mestinon is fresh or you know whatever your optimal. And and your your. Um, Speech is clear, not nasal. You know, that's another thing to watch for in that. Okay. And then is this something that, I mean, it sounds like you can do this at home, but is this something that's um, commonly done like in a clinical exam? Like when you go in and see your neuromuscular specialist, will they have you do the single breath test in, in your visit usually? I have not had that in my neuromuscular exam. Okay. I have when I saw um, neuropulmonary specialists, but other than that, no? Yeah, okay. I was going to say, um, that would be uh, probably more pulmonary. Or respiratory therapist, too? Yeah. And then, Alice, um, in terms of a patient finding their baseline, is that something like could or should a patient, like the next time they do go see 
their neurologist or neuromuscular specialist, could they like request doing that just to have that baseline like on record somewhere? Or is that more something that a patient might just have in their journal at home? It's probably more something a patient would have uh, in their journal at home and then they'd want to notify their doctor if the numbers are starting to trend downward or if they're suddenly uh, going downward. Okay. Okay. Um, I guess this also would be a great time to share, if you ladies want to, a little bit more about your personal experiences with crisis, because you had both mentioned, you know, Esther had experienced two different crises um, quite a ways apart, and Alice has experienced several as well in a sort of a different setting. Um, Esther, do you want to go first and maybe share about your, your first crisis? Okay, my very first one was um, short compared to the second one, um, but it, it began with my having a very bad cold, and I just, the, it, it affected my breathing. Um, when I went into ER, I was not able to talk, so um, I was writing down a little bit what I could. Um, they did give me, in those days, they used Tensilon and because they knew I was not overdosed with Mestinon, they gave me that test. And um, it's, it's a little miracle drug, but it lasts only about four minutes. <laughs> but during that time, I was able to explain what went on. And, and, and then they realized that it was definitely a myosinic crisis, probably be triggered by the uh, bad cold. Um, at that point on that one, I was in about seven days. I was on the respirator about three to four. Um, but then I, I bounced back and by the time I went home, I was fine. And then um, your next crisis, has, I guess, was just a couple of years later, but you said it was much more intense. Intense, um, yeah. <laughs> During prior leading up to my second crisis, I really was going downhill. My myasthenia kept getting worse and worse. Um, they had put me on prednisone and I ended up being on a high dose of prednisone. Um, but that really didn't trigger it to that I could feel that much improvement. Um, not knowing another patient in that era or knowing much about myasthenia, I thought a vacation to the mountains would be a good idea. But it was a driving vacation and we were going through Kansas, which was a hundred and some degrees in the car with no air conditioning. By the time I got to Kansas City, Missouri, um, at night I could not breathe and went into ER. Um, I always carry a list of medical um, professionals that are familiar with MG when I travel. Um, so I did have the name of a physician in Kansas City that I asked for, and that did help me. At least I got good treatment right off the bat, but um, ended up I was intubated, um, within a, uh, a two days, and um, then I, and then they gave me a trait because they could see it was going to last longer. I was in Kansas City for a month and a half, and then I was air ambulance back to Grand Rapids, and I was here um, for another month and a half in the hospital. During that time, I did have a thymectomy, um, and it. At that point, it didn't seem to help, but we were at loose ends of what to do. And this, again, was prior to the immunosuppressant drugs even being available. So it was, it was a long haul. I was on a respirator for three and a half months. Wow. But I'm here today. <laughs> yes. And full, full of vitality, too. You are your own life force, we like to say. Um, now, I don't want to say behind your back. You probably are fully aware that we're saying it, but many people describe Esther as being like her own little ball of energy. 
Now, Alice, I'm um, thankful that I can. I'm actually in remission now, so this is wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> so it is an illness with hope, even in spite of crises. Yeah, from three and a half months on a on a machine to not even being on um, any meds for MG or anything anymore probably feels very like who you know you maybe couldn't have even imagined that at one point in your life right and now you're saying wow I never, here I am at one point during the crisis I did not know if I'd ever get out so yeah well we're very thankful that you did and that you're here with us yeah, so am I yeah <laughs> Now, Alice, um, what, what are some of your experiences, like the very first time that you had a crisis, what was that like for you? And then um, what were some of the things that have been different with your subsequent experiences as well? Uh, well, first off, I guess I've been lucky that mine have usually been very brief compared to some people's experiences. Um, usually uh, hour or two, uh, up to 72 hours was how long I needed respiratory support. So. Uh, I haven't had a prolonged crisis like some people have. Uh, my very first one was triggered by my thymectomy. So after um, the procedure, uh, there was some confusion and I wasn't uh, given any mestinon uh, because no one realized that I had myasthenia gravis. And so I kept asking for it, but no one knew what mestinon was. So, uh, whoa. Eventually, I got so weak that I uh, couldn't, that I stopped breathing. And it was my mother that barged into the PACU and uh, figured out what was going on. And uh, I had medicine in my purse that she was holding. And so she helped admini uh, administer that. And, and it, so, and that, was, so that, was, yeah. that was, was that like you were recovering from your surgery? So you were like in the recovery room kind of thing and we were having trouble breathing? Yeah. And at first they thought it was trouble with anesthesia wearing off. And then uh, when they found out that I had myasthenia gravis, they realized that was the cause of the, of why they had to keep bagging me. It, okay. That kind oh. of surprises me, Alice, because you went in for a thymectomy. <laughs> yeah, um, it was definitely a surprise. Um, I, because I had it done transcervically, people thought that I had my thyroid operated on, I guess. Oh, okay. So then, and so that was um, not a fun experience. I ended up spending a week in the hospital, uh, mostly uh, because of the respiratory weakness. Oh wow! So and how about how old were you? Because you said you had gotten diagnosed at nineteen. So when was the thymectomy? I was twenty-one when I had my thymectomy. I think. Okay, so that was pretty early in your MG experience too, um, Esther. It sounds like by doing the math on yours, you had been living with MG for. Um, a decade or so before you had experienced yeah. yours. Yeah. Okay. I, right. I was diagnosed in 1960 and I had the first crisis in 1973 and the second one in 1975. Okay. And then Alice... My diagnosis wasn't confirmed until my crisis um, because I was seronegative and so the crisis kind of confirmed the diagnosis. Oh, okay. wow. And so also because were... my thymus was big and ugly. <laughs> Big and ugly. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, <laughs> much the, larger than the scan said. So. Oh, okay. So they got in there and said, "Whoa, we're glad we're taking this thing out right now." So um, yeah, I'm it was curious. supposed to be four and a half centimeters, and it was seventeen. So. Wow. So, but you were on mestinon even without a formal MG diagnosis then, because of having been seronegative. But they had found that mestinon was effective. Is that why you were able to have access to that? Uh, yeah, because I had a doctor who believed in treating aggressively or who believed in the existence of seronegative myasthenia gravis. Um, so my antibody tests were negative and my muscle um, studies, my EMG was inconclusive, but my thymus looked enlarged on the scan and then turned out to be very uh, enlarged or abnormal. Okay, so you were... Um... We'll, we'll use the term you're blessed. Yeah, like, so you were, um, you know, blessed to have a clinician who was willing to, you know, because now seronegative MG, like, people, that's more common, right? Like, there, it's talked about a lot more, it sure seems. Um, I've found different antibodies now besides just the main ones. And yeah. I think, are we up to five antibodies now? 
Yeah, I think, yeah. So that's really interesting. And I hadn't ever really pondered that before. Um, but it makes sense, right? That like, you know, there's still clinicians that are like, no, I, I don't know about that. But like having, like, I personally have really just started to learn a lot about MG in the last like two years. <laughs> and so like zero negative tests are like, oh yeah, a lot of people have those, you know, and it's very like, people still believe them, right? Like, oh yeah, okay, I believe your symptoms. Whereas um, it sounds like you were coming from a time where people were like, mm, nah, tests aren't showing it, go home, you're fine. And you're saying, whoa, no, I'm not fine. Something is still going on. And you were able to find a clinician, thankfully, who was listening to you and believing you and willing to take the tests with a bit of a grain of salt um, in order to still treat you effectively or as effectively as they could. That's there was still great. controversy on the diagnosis until maybe the third or fourth crisis. Well, tell us a little bit more about your next crises then, because you had that one. You said you were in the hospital for a week with respiratory weakness and that that confirmed your MG diagnosis. So then um, what kind of happened between then and your next crises experience? Um, the next one was triggered by anesthesia f um, when I was getting a kidney stone removed. Um, I had spinal anesthesia, but it still ended up um, possibly just being flat on my back for the procedure, a little bit sedated, might have been uh, part of the problem too. And it was handled beautifully by the anesthesiologist. She knew I had myasthenia gravis and was prepared, uh, and she intubated me you know, uh, rapidly and got me breathing on the ventilator. and. So how long were you on a ventilator for that experience? Um, just for the afternoon um, for the surgery, and then I uh, was up in the ICU overnight. And okay. I recovered pretty rapidly when the anesthesia wore off. Um, that story had just made me think of something, too. When, when patients are um, experiencing some of the breathing difficulty that can lead to crisis or that indicates that a crisis is being experienced, um, did I hear that like one indication can be if you're laying on your back and having trouble breathing, that that can be an indication that, that some of those muscle nerve communications aren't happening correctly? Uh, yeah, definitely that... for me, um, rolling me on my side by a few more minutes of breathing for me. Yeah. Gener generally, if, if you are having trouble breathing, it's best to sit up. Laying down is, is not good um, because that will only exacerbate it. Okay. So, so that is a, a trigger, um, something to consider as well. You know, it's all these little things that make the big thing. <laughs> A lot of patients kind of instinctively uh, assume what's called the tripod position where they're leaning forward with their arms uh, bounced on their knees and kind of uh, pursed lips to get the maximum uh, air in and out. Okay. Now, Alice, you had mentioned too that you've experienced probably six, you'd said, six different crises. What, um, and that most of them or all of them had been when you were already in a clinical setting. So what were some of the other things that caused you to go into a crisis situation and what did those look like in terms of what sort of, you know, interventions were used? Um, were you ever put on a ventilator for other experiences that you've had as well? Um, I've actually been pretty stubborn about avoiding being on a ventilator, um, had to go on a couple times, but I've also insisted that they try manually ventilating me for uh, 20 minutes, an hour. Um, probably wasn't the nicest thing for me to do because it's not so easy for someone to do that. Their arms get tired. Uh, so I'm not sure I'd recommend that. Um, my most recent crisis was a year and a half ago when I caught um, what should be a minor virus uh, RSV, but being immunocompromised, it turned into a bigger mess. And so I went to the ER just because I was feeling crummy. 
And with my medical history, they admitted me and they were getting ready to discharge me when I said, eh, you know, my breathing's actually starting to really feel weak here. Um, and I had trouble getting any of the nurses to listen to me on that. Um, and so I finally said, I think I've about 30 minutes left on breathing from my experience. And I made it 35 minutes until I um, quit breathing. And then I spent a week in the ICU uh, for that and had to be on a machine for a little bit. And, and being on a respirator or a BiPAP um, really just allows you to have some easy breathing <laughs> is, what, is really what it does. It, it kind of breathes for you while you're having respiratory problems. But it's not something that you would keep keep on you know it's a temporary and that's why even after three months while it was a long time it was temporary so a crisis is not an ongoing you will probably not be having even oxygen to go home with your lung capacity either either is functioning properly or not Okay. That, um, that's yep. My dry camp just needed a break. It was uh, the RSV, I guess, was making my lungs swell up. So it was taking more muscle power to move air in and out. And my muscles finally just got tired of it. And uh, so I had to give them a rest. Yeah. Made for some fatigability. Um, I'm just going to mute myself really quickly. Okay. Sorry, my dog was whining, and I was trying to get Bert's attention to um, tend to him and see what it is that he's whining about. Um, let me think. I guess that temporary crisis thing does bring up something I want to say about advanced directives and DNR orders. Um, we're kind of unique with myasthenia gravis is that because we do have a susceptibility to these breathing problems, but that we also tend to respond very well to treatment. Um, it's not the same as someone who might have a heart attack or stroke and need life support. We tend to respond very well to treatment. And that's something to take into consideration um, if you're considering DNR orders. Um, I do have partial DNR orders myself that allow for respiratory support for myasthenia gravis. Oh, okay. Um, Alice, could you explain a little bit about um, what that, because like I hear that and I, are, we just had a talk um, for those who have been joining us for the annual conference event from the start. We had neuropalliative physician Joel Phillips, um, he I've seen him for us on Tuesday. Yeah, and so he, he talked quite a bit about setting up your durable medical power of attorney and, um, you know, what does that mean for patients? And so what is the difference between this durable medical of a power, a power of attorney documents, um, DNR orders, right? Because that's do not resuscitate, right? So that's if you're not breathing, these orders say what to do in the event. And mine is partial, so I allow respiratory support, um, but I don't uh, want cardiac support, so I don't want full CPR, but I'm okay with um, getting respiratory support or intubation there. And so to file that document, that means that like if you go into a, an emergency room, you're not able to breathe, um, they're able, in theory, they're able to see that and say, okay, well, this, this woman has myasthenia, um, so we're going to try treatment for this breathing issue before we just say, oh, you know, let's see what happens kind of thing. I mean, I, I don't know how that works exactly. So if um, it's caused some arguments uh, sometimes, um, particularly if I'm going in for a procedure, uh, but my family uh, understands my wishes and is on board and I have all the paperwork. Uh, Neuropalliative helped me get all the paperwork uh, together and all the you know, documentation and legal stuff. That's great. Right. Esther, do you have some similar things set in place for yourself as well? Yes, yes, I do. But along with that, I make sure that my neurologist is in tune with the program and my internal medicine doctor and my family. So that if it's a myasthenic crisis, they know that I may have 
um, pulmonary assistance. You know, I don't. Yeah. It's, so, you know. And that's, it's, and that's because, it's, because it's as easy as that, to be very honest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because there's a difference between it being a treatable myasthenic related event versus something that um, the treatment isn't quite so cut and dry and might, might end up right. leaving us with a quality of life that we don't want. Right. And for the myasthenia, a lot of times I've been awake and able to communicate. Exactly. Even though I was in crisis and being you know, manually ventilated. And um, this is the difference between a myasthenic on a respirator. Um, even even when I had a tra trach and couldn't talk, I could I was m very alert to um, to work with the attending um, medical personnel that I could relate what what my needs were. Okay, um, and you had mentioned a couple of minutes ago too. You know, machines like a BiPAP are are those used sometimes in the clinical setting like instead of a ventilator um or i guess like what's the what what are some new um, i've had it used for me before along with a respiratory therapist who was kind of uh assigned to hold my throat open uh so he spent a hour uh, holding my airway open manually because i was being stubborn about being intubated and finally uh, gave in but <laughs> He sang me songs the whole time, so that was sweet of him. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. Serenaded you while you were being manually, <laughs> manually vented. So, I, I have a myasthenic friend who has a BiPAP, and if she feels she's having uh, breathing issues, but that they're controllable, she will use her BiPAP, not necessarily just at night, but during the day. To give herself a little rest. I do the same a lot of times when I come home um, from school. I'll uh, sit and study or watch uh, YouTube stuff uh, with a BiPAP on for an hour just to give my muscles a break. Right. Okay. So Alice, you have a, you have a BiPAP that you use anyway, like at night, like for you know, a, like a sleep apnea type thing or something like that. And because you have that machine, then you're able to utilize that at home. Um, I also have a cough assist machine uh, and a suction machine. Uh, they hooked me up with all the fancy equipment after my last crisis. Okay. Okay. Well, lots of times when you are on a crisis, you have excess saliva, and this is where she's talking about suctioning. Um, and if, swallowing. If you don't have it, an, a toothbrush does real well pulling it out. <laughs> okay. So, oh, so you sorry. learn some. You learn some little things, uh, particularly uh, mastinon can give you excess saliva, and while this is one uh, aspect to consider going into a crisis it may be just part of your living <laughs> and so uh, this is um I, it was one of my workarounds my toothbrush was used for more than just brushing teeth <laughs> that makes sense because you know if the crisis is affecting the diaphragm and lungs and those muscles and nerves then of course um it's not going to be easy to cough to you know spit to do anything like that in that like throat neck region and so if you um, have any saliva at all where it, that's one of those autonomic things we don't usually think about we just swallow it or whatever right but all of a sudden it my swallowing can't... tends to go out uh and my gag reflex tends to go out too at the same time that my breathing gets weak okay yeah so that could kind of then we then we're talking about some other issues that are now we're in a cycle, right? Because now we might be aspirating and getting some of that fluid into the lungs because we can't get it down the right tube. And now we might be talking about some sort of pneumonia or other lung infection as well. So this can kind of be a slippery slope, right? So that's why it's probably even more important to you know, recognize when you need the breathing help. So using that BiPAP in the middle of the day to give yourself the rest you need to be able to keep functioning, right? Um, and then also kind of recognizing like, okay, the, 
the things that I'm doing day to day aren't working as well this week as they were. Uh, maybe I need to call my doctor and kind of see what's going on with that. Well, this has been very interesting. Um, it's really wonderful to have both of you ladies here to talk with us a little bit more about um, these ve like very different crises experiences that the two of you have had, and yet very similar in a lot of ways. Is there just, any- Just like myasthenia gravis patients. We're, we all have, <laughs> have MG, but we're little snowflakes that, <laughs> that have different little quirks. Yeah. Esther, is there anything else that you want to share with the MG family about um, crisis from yours or other patients' perspectives? Um, no, I think just knowing the symptoms, um, you know, be aware. Um, we are here at the Myasena Gravis of Michigan office. If, if you don't feel you're ready to go to ER, you know, that you, your symptoms are getting worse, give us a call. We're here to walk with you on your MG journey. And, and along with your physician. We don't take the place of the physician. We're just MG patients, but we have kind of been there, done that. So we're there to be with you on it. And remind you or help remind you that um, even though it's certainly probably a very scary experience, it's a scary experience that a lot of people have gotten through and have been able to navigate. Um, and, and maybe it doesn't need to be quite as scary as it is. And sometimes reaching out to somebody else who has experienced it or can kind of walk you through that can really help um, alleviate some of that fear and that stress that feeds into some of the some of the problems in the first place, right? I wanted to say um, I found going into crisis not as scary as the idea of it was. The actual experience was not as bad as I feared it would be. That's great. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Alice, because that probably just a, a collective sigh of relief for some of the people who are saying, uh-oh, <laughs> like I, you know, I haven't experienced this and 10 to 25% isn't a lot, but you know, if, if it were me, I would also be thinking like, gosh, you know, MG's rare too. Clearly, <laughs> clearly the, the things like to, you know, like to happen to me kind of thing is what, what I might find myself getting into that thought process. So that's probably very comforting for people to hear. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with the MG family or other patients? Uh, yeah, during our last talk, we talked a little bit about how trouble breathing from myasthenia gravis differs from other causes of trouble breathing that emergency rooms or EMTs or other doctors are more familiar with. Sometimes they don't seem to quite know what to do with a uh, myasthenia gravis patient or they don't quite realize how severe our respiratory weakness is until it suddenly becomes a crisis. Uh, one of the things that is commonly used is similar and for other types of breathing trouble, that's great. For myasthenia gravis, it can be inaccurate. Uh, that's a little clip thing that they put on your finger that shines a light and then shows a percentage. Uh, if you're breathing fine, you're at 98% or so. And then uh, if you're not breathing, it starts to drop rapidly. For a lot of myasthenic patients, they'll be fine until they're in full crisis. Uh, they don't always have a gradual drop off like someone with um, pneumonia or asthma might have. So if they're, so using, very, if the they're using that oxygen monitor. You're not. Okay. Yeah. So if they're using that as the exclusive like test of whether or not you're getting enough oxygen in with MG, it might be at 98%, 98%, 98%, 10% all of a sudden. Whereas with pneumonia, it might be 98%, 96%. Yeah, for me, it took a full minute after I stopped breathing before my numbers dropped. Oh. Uh, so that was a surprise to the um, clinicians, but not a surprise to me because I was experiencing the subjective symptoms of increasing respiratory weakness. But it looked like I was okay until suddenly I wasn't. 
what would be um, maybe a tip or like a recommendation then for a patient who like, let's say somebody's sure that they're in crisis and they've called an ambulance to take them to the hospital. Like what should they be ready to do or say to make sure that there's the staff on the ambulance knows what's going on, that the clinic clinician at the hospital understands that the, this isn't maybe necessarily going to work for them. What are some tips that you might have? Uh, reminding them that myasthenia gravis is different. It is not a lung problem. It is a wiring problem or a neuromuscular problem. So the lungs stay clear and healthy. Uh, it's just the communication to the diaphragm that goes out. And so therefore measuring uh, oxygen levels with a pulse oximeter is not accurate. Um, doing a uh, arterial blood draw, uh, carbon dioxide levels, um, those tend to be more accurate. Uh, doing the rest, uh, getting a respiratory therapist uh, on board or uh, respiratory therapist input uh, helped me when I was in the hospital. Uh, all the RTs seemed to understand myasthenia gravis and were able to kind of explain it to some of the doctors. Mm -hmm. okay. And I guess last time too we talked about things that emergency personnel look for when they're evaluating someone's breathing. Um, we mentioned the patient leaning forward or in the tripod position sitting up when they're struggling to breathe. Uh, my cynics don't always do that because sometimes we can't sit up uh, but that is kind of a classic thing that patients who have trouble breathing will lean forward and balance their arms on their knees and lean their head forward, purse their lips, they'll start to have shorter and shorter sentences with more um, gasping for breath in between. Their voice may sound uh, short of breath, nasal, trouble projecting, uh, lower volume. And so that's something that you can look for in yourself too. If you're starting to talk like that, that's a sign that your breathing is not very good. Um, other things, is our use of accessory muscles. So normally we rely mostly on our diaphragm to breathe, but as that starts to weaken, we'll start to use neck muscles, shoulder muscles. Sometimes we'll use the entire body and kind of bob up and down, trying to get uh, more air in, use the intercostal muscles between the ribs. Uh, those tend to tire quite rapidly though which can sounds like speed up the, the end result somewhat too, right? Because the faster you're using the strength that you do have, <laughs> then the faster it's going to go away if it's not um, remedied with whatever treatment needs to be used. Okay. And that's also one of the reasons why it can seem sudden or abrupt to observers when a myocentic crisis happens, because your instinct is fully off yourself trying to breathe. You'll work uh, your muscles until they absolutely won't work anymore. So it can seem like you're fine, 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 stop. Whereas when you're feeling it, you feel your muscles tire, but you can't always observe it um, objectively. It's more of a subjective feeling. That makes sense. And it sounds like some of that too is just the what Esther, you know, you had said right at the beginning is you've just, you've got to listen to your body, right? Like you can't, um, you can't necessarily ask the question in the Facebook group and wait for other people to answer it for you. Sometimes you've got to listen, ask yourself the question and listen to what your body's telling you that might not be um, the common answer or, you know, like even the can be test, right? when you're in the hospital or at, in the emergency room, um, I've had the dollars no, this isn't something we can wait on. You need to get a crash cart in here. Right. That self advocacy. And and the thing is, is it's it's a breathing um, a, a diaphragm problem. It's not a oxygen problem. So oh yeah, good point. Uh, when you are going to ER, we have little um, um, medical, um, shoot, I can't think of the name of it now, but uh, emergency little cards. Make sure 
that if you don't have one, you call our MGMI office and get one because this is, it tells people that you have myasthenia gravis and then they will be more ready to treat you because it's, they will probably, if, if they understand myasthenia, they would probably use an ambu bag before they would use oxygen. They're going to help you breathe, not flood you with oxygen when you can't even breathe it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so our lungs are clear. We don't really need more right. oxygen. We just need right. motion. Uh, and that can be provided with an ambu bag pushing air in and out. I call, I always say I don't have any lung power. <laughs> I actually have an ambu bag as part of my um, first aid kit in my apartment and I've shown my um, mother okay. how to use it. Yep. Yep. Good. Well, thank you, ladies. Um, this has been really, really informative and hopefully for our family who's tuned in and, and listening that we've all, I know I've learned plenty. Um, and this is even the second time that we've sat and done this talk. So um, that's, I think, a testament to the great information that the two of you have based on your very, what did we say, very similar and very different and very vast experience trying to navigate um, MG and just medic your medical care in general. Um, is there any last things you would like to add today? We can definitely, um, we'll, we'll figure out, you know, Esther and Alice and I can talk on our end and we can see, you know, maybe another event over the winter where we can all connect again on some tips and tricks and ways that we can um, live our best lives with MG because that's really what I know NGMI is here to help you all do, and I'm imagining that's most everyone's goal if you're here with us today or if you've been joining us for this annual conference event here in uh, this strange year that we have been having. Um, we want to thank you again for joining us for this event today on Thursday. Our conference, um, the new content anyway for the conference wraps up tomorrow at noon Eastern time. We're gonna have a Zoom call with Dr. Amit Sachdev of Michigan State University. Um, he is, he's got a lot of credentials. We won't go into those today. You'll learn about them tomorrow, but he's gonna give us an MG research update. So uh, we would love to have you join us for that. If you haven't been part of the videos prior to today, please go check those out. Those are lower, um, lower down on the event page and our carousel. And then we'll have a more comprehensive discussion with all of our panelists in November. So make sure that well, if you're here, you're registered. So we have your email and we'll make sure that we send you an email about when that panel discussion is happening. Of course, if you have any questions prior to that, if you wanna ask Esther or Alice a question, or if you've got questions about any of the other presentations we have, please do feel free to email info at mg-mi.org. And um, I'd be happy to forward those questions to whomever it is that you are asking of them, and um, I, I'm not, I don't want to speak for Alice, but she's a very generous, wonderful, sharing woman, so I'm sure she'd be happy to answer any questions you have for her if we send them and I'm, way. I'm on the Facebook support group sites if you want to look me up there, too. Yeah, yeah, you're also welcome. We have um, our public Facebook page um, here for MGMI, but we also have a private group. So if you're not part of that private Facebook group, feel free to click on over. You'll have to just answer a couple questions that, so that we know you're not, um, you know, some bot trying to sell our our attendees or our joiners any crazy products or whatever, but um, otherwise you can always join that private group and know that um, any questions that you ask there or things that you share aren't out there on the, the public page at least. Um, and then of course, you can always send us an email or if you call the office, um, it's very likely that Esther's gonna be there to answer any questions you have about that as well. And I want to thank everyone again for um, joining us today. We all really appreciate it. And we look forward to connecting with all of you again very soon. Have a great day. Bye. Mm, goodbye.